I will be talking today on the management and conservation of Alberta's farmyard bats. Uh, during the summer, when uh, uh, we we're able to get out in the field and survey bats, uh, this uh, scene right here is uh, uh, something pretty typical that a bat biologist would do. Uh, we're setting up uh, mist nets to capture bats over this uh, river in uh, southwestern Alberta. Uh, these mist nets are very similar to uh, badminton nets. They're very fine uh, filament nets and the bats fly in and become entangled. And then we can very delicately take them out and we can take various measurements and figure out what species are in an area and then we can release them. Uh, so this is just uh, uh, one of the things that I would do in a year. I could just as easily have shown a picture of myself st uh, staring at a computer screen, uh, but that wouldn't be nearly as interesting. Uh, for this talk, I am going to uh, uh, focus on farmyard bats, but I'll begin with an overview of the Alberta Community Bat Program and an introduction to the bats of Alberta. I'm going to summarize some of the key conservation challenges that bats in Alberta are facing, I'm going to discuss some of the uh, basics of bat biology, and importantly, I want to uh, spend some time discussing what bats need to thrive in their environment. And that has direct uh, um, relevance to how they uh, can be managed uh, when they're occupying farmland. The best way to learn about our program is to go to our website, albertabats.ca. Uh, you'll notice at the top uh, right-hand corner, we have links to our various social media accounts. Uh, we have a ton of information on those uh, social media accounts, and it's a great way to uh, keep up with what's going on in the bat conservation world and to uh, uh, learn more and to join a growing community of uh, bat conservation uh, uh, enthusiasts. And that's albertabats.ca. Uh, we also have several guides uh, that can be downloaded on our resource page. We have guides on managing bats in buildings. We have a guide uh, uh, on uh, uh, enhancing uh, habitats uh, to benefit bats. We have a guide on bat houses. Uh, we even have a coloring and activity guide that can be downloaded and, and given to kids or uh, an enthusiastic adult. We, uh, we also have a brochure on bat-friendly farming uh, that might be uh, applicable to some of the uh, guests on this uh, uh, webinar. Alberta has nine species of bats. There's over 1,400 species in the entire world. Uh, so our, the number of bats we have isn't large, uh, but they are very common on the landscape and they're some of the most common uh, wildlife occupying our skies uh, during the nighttime. Uh, the nine uh, species we have in Alberta could be broken into two uh, groups based on a uh, very important behavioral difference. Uh, three of those bats, the eastern red bat, the hoary bat, and the silver-haired bat, uh, they don't spend the winter in Alberta. They uh, fly uh, south or west for the winter and uh, uh, spend the winter in warmer climates. They may still hibernate, but they're not required to hibernate for quite as long because they're in a milder climate. The other six species, though, uh, they, uh, they spend the winter in Alberta. They may undergo fairly long distance migrations up to uh, over 400 kilometers in some cases, uh, but they're staying in the province and they're spending about six months of the year hibernating. And that includes uh, the big brown bat and the little brown myotis, which are the two most common bats occupying buildings in Alberta. It also includes the northern myotis, which is uh, one of the more common bats in the boreal forest and would almost certainly be very common around Grand Prairie. We have the long-eared myotis, which uh, probably occurs around Grand Prairie as well. Uh, and uh, the long-legged myotis, which uh, uh, we've uh, detected near White Court, so it's quite possibly near Grand Prairie as well. Uh, the western small-footed myotis, the smallest bat we have in Alberta, uh, does not occur in the boreal regions of the province. Alarmingly, of the nine species we have in Alberta, uh, five of them are already considered endangered. Uh, this includes the little brown myotis and the northern myotis, which are endangered under both the Federal Species at Risk Act and the Alberta Wildlife Act. 
And three species, the eastern red bat, the hoary bat, and the silver-haired bat, have recently been assessed by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, uh, COSIWIC, as being endangered. And I'll discuss a little bit more uh, coming up. The reasons for those endangerments, though, uh, vary by group. The three bats that migrate south for the winter are endangered primarily because of the effect of wind turbines. Uh, the uh, east, the little brown myotis and the northern myotis are endangered because of white nose syndrome, a disease that may also affect some of the other myotis species we have in Alberta uh, that we don't have great data on. Because of a recent change to the Alberta Wildlife Act regulations, all bats in Alberta are now protected. It is illegal to kill a bat anywhere in the province, regardless of species. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time discussing the two main threats uh, that we're concerned about when it comes to managing bats. Uh, the first and the one that has received the most media attention is white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome is an invasive exotic fungus that was introduced uh, sometime around 2006. It started off in the area of New York and it's been spreading from state to state and province to province uh, since that time. This is a fungus that grows on bats while they hibernate during the winter. During the summer, it doesn't affect them at all. During the winter, it colonizes their skin membranes and it begins to eat away at their epidermis, which causes uh, frequent arousals from hibernation. They deplete their fat stores and large numbers of bats in affected regions have been found dead. In Eastern North America, uh, population declines well in excess of 90% have been documented in numerous locations. In some caves, the population decline has exceeded 98%. So this is a map of where the fungus or the disease has been detected uh, as of uh, last year. Uh, it's now in Alberta and I'll show uh, some more detail uh, regarding that shortly. Uh, but it's just now beginning to uh, enter uh, the province. And it's fairly widespread at this point, occurring across most regions of the province, uh, except in the very, or uh, occurring across most regions of North America, except in the very Northern uh, regions of the country. We've been leading monitoring for uh, uh, white nose syndrome and the and its uh, fungus uh, 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 PD. Uh, PD stands for Pseudogymnoascus destructans. It's the fungus that causes white nose syndrome. Uh, currently, we have not detected white nose syndrome in Alberta, uh, but we have detected the fungus that causes white nose syndrome in numerous regions. We've detected it along the Milk River and its tributaries. We've detected it along the Red Deer River and the South Saskatchewan River. We've detected it along the Battle River, or we have an inconclusive detection along the Battle River, but we suspect it's uh, established there. And we've detected the fungus along the Beaver River uh, near Cold Lake. So this fungus is right now entering the province. Uh, notably, we have not detected it in the Rocky Mountains, which gives hope that perhaps there is still a remnant population in the province that could be more resistant to this fungus uh, than uh, has occurred elsewhere in the country. Uh, we have not detected white nose syndrome and we have not detected evidence of a population decline. We don't think uh, that we're going to be able to stop white nose syndrome before it causes population decline in Alberta, uh, but we are, in, but we are instead going uh, trying to focus on ensuring that the bats that can survive have the best chances uh, for survival and uh, reproductive success to help rebuild their population. There is some evidence from Eastern North America that uh, population declines are starting to stabilize, that uh, there is a resistant population that has potential to, uh, um, to, uh, to grow over uh, the next few years, at least for little brown bats. The other threat facing bats is wind turbines. And this one is uh, very topical lately because of the recent listing by Kosiwik 
of those three species as endangered. Uh, each, there's been quite a bit of work done on uh, the effect of wind turbines on bats beginning as early as about 2008 in Alberta. Uh, some of the early monitoring data shows that uh, wind turbines in the province can kill upwards on average of 11 bats each. Uh, when there's only a few turbines, uh, that, that level of uh, mortality uh, may be sustainable. Uh, but the uh, wind energy industry is currently on an exponential growth, growth curve where we're expecting several fold increases in wind energy capacity uh, over the next uh, uh, few decades. So cumulatively, we think that per, uh, potentially over 10,000 bats in Alberta could be uh, uh, dying uh, each year because of wind turbines. And that's primarily of two species, the hoary bat and the silver haired bat. Uh, the best population modeling we have uh, suggests that uh, the current level of mortality caused by wind turbines is not sustainable, uh, but there has been a lot of research uh, showing ways that we can reduce the high levels of fatalities that have been observed. One of the most important things that we can do is to increase the cut-in wind speed of turbines. Uh, this is the wind speed uh, before wind turbines begin rotating and generating electricity. By only operating wind turbines and really high wind speeds, uh, we can greatly reduce bat fatalities because they tend not to uh, bats tend not to fly uh, when it's really windy. So most of the mortality is actually occurring during low wind speeds when the wind turbines are producing the least amount of electricity. These fatalities can also be lowered by uh, not operating wind turbines at night or during the peak of fall migration. And uh, there's uh, some increasing research showing potential for smart curtailment systems, which are able to detect periods when there is a high risk of bat mortality and to uh, change operation parameters so that those fatalities can be avoided. But one of the most important things we can do is keep wind farms away from rivers and other migratory pathways. We know that bats uh, fly along rivers, both for feeding and for uh, uh, migration. Uh, rivers are really important flyways for bats, and uh, some rivers are also important hibernation habitat, not for the migratory species, but for the species that overwinter here in Alberta. Uh, this is just one example. This is showing the Battle River and one of its tributaries, Paint Earth Creek. Uh, one of the worst possible places to put a wind farm would be right between these two uh, riparian areas, and yet that's exactly where one is being built here in Alberta. And this is not unique. Many of the wind farms in Alberta are placed right along uh, rivers, which are uh, the areas that would, we would expect the highest levels of bat fatalities. There is currently a, consul, a consultation period open uh, for uh, as part of the listing uh, process uh, under the Federal Species at Risk Act for those three migratory species. Uh, they're accepting uh, public feedback until May 16th. Uh, so I encourage everyone on this call uh, to submit uh, comments uh, in encouraging the listing of these three species. You can find a link to that on our webpage. When we began our program in 2016, we uh, started a community science project or a citizen science project where we encourage the, uh, uh, the public with uh, bats roosting on their property uh, to submit their op or to submit a report of their observation to our program and importantly to collect a bat guano sample. So bat guano is their poop. Uh, that guano has a uh, uh, traces of their DNA uh, within it. And we can send that to a lab uh, to figure out what species is occupying uh, that roosting structure. And we've been doing that over the last uh, uh, what is it now, eight years, and we have hundreds of uh, lab results for these different roosts reported to our program. And we're getting some really great data to better understand the use, especially of, of uh, human structures uh, in Alberta. Uh, what we found is that over 85% of the uh, 
reports we've received of roosting bats have been of little brown myotis. Little brown myotis is the endangered species. It's endangered because of white nose syndrome, but because we don't have white nose syndrome yet in Alberta, uh, our bats are still doing fine. And they account for the vast majority of, of, uh, of the bats that people are encountering. Most of the remaining bats are big brown bats. And every now and then we get a report of a different species. And one I would highlight is along the Peace River, which is a long eared myotis uh, roosting in someone's uh, building. And we've since detected the species at another location along the Peace River uh, using a bridge. Uh, so we're pretty sure that this species uh, occurs farther, northern, uh, farther north in Alberta along the Peace River uh, in regions that we didn't formally uh, realize they were uh, present. So again, what we're uh, hoping to receive is a, a sample of bat guano. This is what guano looks like. It's basically rice-sized, but black. And unlike my, mouse feces, which is also present in a lot of uh, uh, barns, it, uh, it easily crumbles and it tends to be concentrated in a pile uh, directly below where these bats are roosting. And we have a report on our uh, web page where that you can fill out and submit along with that observation. A very quick uh, overview of bat uh, morphology. Uh, as you know, they have wings, but those wings are an, a modification of their hand. So we have the same uh, bones in our hand that the bat has in its wing. Their fingers are greatly elongated and they have a skin stretched between their fingers. Uh, they also have this stubby little thumb that sticks out from their wing. Uh, and it's really important because they use it for climbing. Uh, it's the only way they can climb is that one hook on either uh, thumb that they use very similar to ice picks. Uh, they also have really great hearing. Uh, it's their one of their most impressive adaptations is their hearing and their ability to echolocation to navigate during the night. Uh, but contrary to myth, all bats have really good vision as well. They use vision for seeing things off in the uh, far distance, which they can't uh, see using echolocation alone. And bats are mammals. Uh, because bats are mammals, they have many of the same behaviors that we have. Uh, most importantly, their young are drinking milk until they are able to fly on their own. So unlike with birds, they're not bringing their young uh, chewed up insects or anything of the sorts, they're feeding their young milk until their young can uh, feed on their own. Most of the bats we have in Alberta give birth to a single pup per year, which makes them some of the slowest reproducing animals for their size in the world. There are a few bats, mainly the migratory ones, long distance migratory ones that can give birth to twins or in rare occasions up to four. Uh, but the overwhelming majority of the time, uh, bats are giving birth to just one or two pups per year. The oldest bat in the world uh, was documented to be about 41 years. That's a species of myotis in Russia. But the oldest bat in North America, as far as I am aware, is one from Cadman Cave, uh, not far from uh, where you are now in all likelihood. Uh, it's near Hinton in Alberta. And based on banding records, we know that this bat was at least 39 years old. It's really hard to age a bat. You have to attach a band with a unique number, and then you have to find it alive uh, that many years later. And that was a, a little brown myotis. One thing I do want to emphasize, I handle lots of bats. So I might you might see lots of uh, photos of people handling bats. Uh, we've been vaccinated for rabies. We're also regularly tested. Uh, so we're really uh, well protected, but you are probably not. So uh, we want to encourage uh, people to leave bats alone. And in the rare cases that they have to be handled, such as if you have one in your house, uh, make sure you put on leather gloves to protect against bites. Bats do not deliberately attack people. They don't fly into people's hair. They're very maneuverable. Uh, so they want to avoid you, or sometimes they'll feed right above your head on the swarm of insects that you're attracting. But all bats will readily bite in self-defense. So if you put your hand on them, they will bite you. Uh, sometimes a contact is accidental, uh, but that is rare. If you are bit though, uh, there is effective treatment that can be administered as long as you get it done soon after exposure. 
Uh, the main concern is from rabies, and rabies requires a bite or uh, potentially a scratch uh, in order for you to get it. Rabies, however, is very rare. You hear in the media that upwards of 10% of bats have rabies. That is uh, um, not based on accurate information. Uh, in free-flying bats, the ones that are healthily flying around, the rate is well under 1%. It is, however, more common among bats that are already exhibiting signs of rabies, such as bats that are on the ground or flying uh, uh, in strange ways around people. If you don't touch bats, though, there is no risk. Many of you probably have had bats in a building. Uh, they can be uh, safely removed outside. Just make sure you wear gloves. Uh, a net can sometimes work well. If it's landed somewhere where you can get a box on top of it, uh, capturing it the same way you might a bee uh, works uh, great. Uh, the bat can be removed, can be moved outside and uh, uh, placed up somewhere high, ideally after sunset. Uh, one potential way of uh, releasing a bat is to put it in a pillowcase and tack it to a tree up high, and then when it's ready, it can uh, take off and uh, resume its nighttime activities. Uh, we have much more information, uh, by the way, on our website for how to deal with uh, stranded uh, bats. At this time of year, it is uh, uh, the end, coming up on the end of February. Bats are hibernating until... Uh, about sometime in April or May, uh, around uh, the middle of April, perhaps late April, bats will begin moving to their summer uh, habitats, which might be a barn on your property or a nearby building. Uh, some bats uh, also roost in natural structures, uh, uh, trees, uh, rock crevices, those sorts of places. And once they arrive on their summer habitat, the, uh, most of the females will already be pregnant. And uh, around the, uh, starting as early as the middle of June and continuing until about mid-July, uh, bats will give birth to a pup. And then one month after the pups are born, uh, those pups are, be, are able to fly on their own. And those pups will spend uh, the next uh, a few months feeding on insects and fattening up in preparation for the winter. The adults, however, uh, move to their hibernation sites and engage in uh, behavior we call swarming, uh, which is uh, a mating session that bats undergo uh, prior to going into hibernation. Now, once the pups start flying, which happens uh, uh, as early as sometime in July, uh, we often uh, get reports of bats showing up in highly unusual places. The pups are very similar to human teenagers. They often do things that are not entirely wise and uh, they're much more likely to get noticed. They're also migrating, so they need some place to rest and they might not be familiar with the roosting locations in the area. So now I wanna talk about what bats need to thrive in their environment. Like all animals, bats need access to food, water, and shelter. And they also need to be able to reach these uh, different resources, and we call that commuting habitat. So the more readily available these three resources are in their environment, the more likely it is to support bats. But we also need to consider when we're trying to conserve bats, we need to consider the threats that they're, in fa that they're facing in their environment. I, al I already discussed wind turbines, uh, outdoor cats are a major predator of bat, uh, bats. Unlike us, uh, the cats can actually hear the bats flying around and they're very good at locating uh, where those bats are resting during the day. Uh, some buildings have uh, chimneys that uh, don't have protective covers and lots of bats die from entrapment when they fly into things like chimneys and vents and uh, other structures around people's homes. Uh, water, uh, water barrels are a major hazard, and, and so on. And I'll discuss a little bit, uh, those th threats a little bit more uh, coming up. Different species uh, tend to roost in different locations, uh, but there are a few types of structures that are really important for uh, shelter for bats. So we call, we call places where bats rest, uh, we call them roosts. 
Uh, many of uh, many of those on this uh, 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 webinar have likely uh, heard of bat boxes, and many of you might have built bat boxes. Uh, those are roosting structures used by species like little brown bats and big brown bats. Uh, we have bat condos. Uh, barns are often used by little brown bats and big brown bats as well. A lot of different bats um, uh, rely on old trees where they hide under sloughing bark or in cracks and crevices of the tree. Uh, some bats uh, roost in rock crevices or in places uh, where there's lots of eroded rocks, such as along rivers. And uh, some even roost in bridges, which I'm going to discuss a little bit more uh, coming up. Places where bats uh, roost during the day, uh, we, call the, we call those sites day roosts. And one type of day roost is the maternity roost, which is a location uh, where female bats are raising their pups. Maternity roosts tend to uh, support the greatest number of bats, with some in Alberta uh, uh, exceeding uh, 1,000 bats. Uh, and most of the really large colonies are from little brown myotis. Females tend not to form large groups, so it's the females that are forming the really large groups. Uh, bats also have places that they use to rest during the night, and we call those night roosts. It, you might uh, notice if you have a, um, a, a home used by bats, you might notice bat droppings around your porch, but not see any evidence of bats. Uh, those are uh, oftentimes from uh, night roosting bats that are there at night, but not during the day. These are two tree roosts uh, near, uh, in this case, near Lesser Slave Lake. Uh, that were used by bats. The one on the, uh, the trembling aspen on the left uh, supported a little over 100 little brown myotis. The balsam poplar on the right uh, had about 400 little brown myotis. And I know that because uh, I counted them as they flew out. Uh, this is a uh, sandstone boulder uh, where uh, long-eared myotis were roosting in those vertical crevices that you can see in the middle of the boulder. Uh, this is a silver-haired bat that during migration was hiding in a crevice on this uh, sandstone uh, rocky outcrop. Uh, most of the time, the species is actually roosting in trees, but in areas where trees aren't available, uh, they can uh, switch to using uh, uh, rock crevices. This is a hoary bat. Uh, this species does not uh, necessarily roost in uh, crevices of trees. It instead hides out uh, hidden among the foliage of living trees, usually a very tall tree and out towards the edge of the crown, uh, which is inaccessible to most uh, predators. Uh, it also has this amazing camouflage uh, that is perfect that, that perfectly blends in with the color of bark. Uh, so if you missed that bat, uh, there is a close-up showing it against the bark of this tree. This is an uh, old granary uh, that uh, if you were to go inside and look right up at the ridge line of the roof, you would see these bats staring back at you. I'm not going to show video, but if you wanted to see video of these bats in this granary, uh, you can visit our YouTube channel and see a video of that. This is a very typical uh, house that would be used by bats. Uh, this is perfectly designed for attracting bats. It's an old wood structure. Wood is excellent for bats because they can grip it very easily. It also has lots of separations along the wood, which creates access into the interior portions of the house. Uh, bats can roost under the cedar shake uh, uh, shingles. They can roost under the folds of the umbrella down below. And if you look around the other side of the house near the dormer, there is a very large pile of bat guano uh, starting to accumulate, which is a, is a sure sign that there is a bat roost uh, right above that location. You can see the uh, uh, the soffits of this dormer have separated, uh, giving access to these bats. Another common access point of bats into buildings is under loose uh, uh, flashing around chimneys and vents. This is another building, and this uh, one uh, one thing I've seen uh, fairly common is uh, old buildings that have chimneys made of brick or, or cinder block that project through the attic and 
once these bats get into the attic, they can fly around and they love the cinder block or brick chimneys because they're easy to grip and they st stay a nice temperature. And they're often hiding, they often tuck up and hide in the crevices right around the chimney. Uh, it's really obvious that there's bats in this attic because there's guano stuck to the chimney and all throughout the insulation of the attic. In some cases, those bats are not welcome. And one, uh, one tool that's often used to help uh, address that situation are these one-way exits. These one-way exits or bat valves allow bats to crawl out, um, but in order to get back in, they would have to lift up this, this flap and, and crawl through smooth plastic, which is often too difficult for bats. Uh, so they can get out, but not re-enter. These cannot be used during the middle of the summer because pups cannot leave without their mother. So if these one-way exits are used, all the pups would end up dying. This is a chimney of a school. It doesn't have proper screening. If you look inside that chimney, it, the bottom of the chimney is littered with these dead bats. Often what happens with bats is one bat to be, uh, gets into trouble. It emits these uh, distress calls, which attract all their roost mates. Uh, who try to save them and they end up suffering the same fate. So oftentimes something that would normally just kill one bat actually ends up killing uh, many bats all at once. And just to complicate matters, there is one bat, just one in Al uh, type of bat in Alberta that hibernates in buildings and that's the big brown bat. We, we don't have any records of the other species spending the winter in buildings. It's the big brown bat, and they're a large-bodied bat. They may be able to deal with the drier conditions of buildings, uh, but that it, it does complicate management because you can't simply, if you know you have big brown bats, you can't simply seal up the holes during the winter because there's a risk of trapping them uh, inside. We have lots of information on our website for managing bats and buildings, but there are a few that I want to highlight. First, uh, do, do not exclude bats from buildings unless it's absolutely necessary. I know there's lots of farms around that have bats and barns or old buildings around the farmyard, and those uh, should absolutely be allowed to stay if they're not creating any risk uh, to people on the property. But sometimes uh, bats are using areas where uh, they create problems. They might be uh, uh, causing uh, soiling of insulation of a, ver of a valuable home, for example. And it might be uh, necessary to, um, uh, to manage those bats. But even when that's the case, there are some steps that uh, should be taken to avoid unnecessary harm to those bats. And proper timing is critical. Uh, do not exclude bats from buildings from June to August uh, using any method uh, because they have pups present and any attempt to exclude them uh, will cause death to uh, those bats. Uh, but bats can still be removed from living spaces of a home and they should not be allowed to enter the living spaces of a home. Um, so uh, the external uh, areas or areas where they uh, will not enter uh, places where people live are okay, but they should not be allowed to enter living spaces. Uh, One-way exits uh, should be used in May or September. And if you're sure you don't have overwintering big brown bats, uh, the work can also be done during the winter. And it's rarely appropriate to trap and relocate bat colonies, although I know it's been done uh, in the past. You can uh, find our exclusion calendar in one of our guides, the uh, uh, beneficial management practices for pest control operators. We're uh, in the process of updating some of our other guides to include our exclusion calendars as well. So one important question we often uh, receive is has to do with bat boxes. And bat boxes are uh, structures uh, that uh, are meant to uh, function similar to a bird box where you put up these structures and then uh, bats move in. But there are some important differences. First, they tend to be a lot larger than bird uh, bird houses. Uh, there are some um, uh, bat boxes that you can buy from hardware stores that are about the size of bird uh, bird houses, but those are not effective. So those should be avoided. Uh, some of these bat boxes, though, can support upwards of four or 500 uh, bats, and it's usually little brown bats or sometimes big brown bats. 
Uh, we have nine species in Alberta. That means that seven of them are not very often using bat boxes. So installing bat boxes to benefit bats is really only uh, benefiting two species, and it's two species that are already our most common uh, species in the province. And the concern that we have is that by attracting common species into an area, it could create competition for other species that do not use bat boxes. Uh, there are, is also some evidence that some types of bat boxes are prone to overheating. In some cases, these bat boxes in full sun uh, can reach upwards of 60 degrees Celsius, especially the large single chambered designs. And bat boxes are only suitable in a location uh, where they can remain in place for decades. It could be harmful if those boxes are up for a few years, attract bats, and then have to be removed because of problems or complaints about bats being in, in the area. This is a park in southern Alberta that has about a dozen bat boxes. Uh, if you look up from the bottom, you can see these bats staring back down at you. Uh, most of these bat boxes had uh, upwards of uh, a couple hundred bats in them. Uh, so cumulatively, the site uh, supported uh, potentially as many as 2,000 bats. Uh, this is one of the more uh, active bat boxes. You can see there's lots of piecicles that are starting to form within the bat box and there is clear evidence that these boxes are overheating because a lot of the bats have a uh, fleed during the daytime and are hanging out on the outside of the bat box, which is not a normal behavior unless they're in uh, some form of distress. Recently, our program released a best management practices guide uh, for bat houses in uh, across North America. Uh, we also have a separate guide that's just for Alberta that has much the same information. Uh, but I do want to highlight some of the uh, key messages. One, do not install bat boxes in natural areas. Uh, in natural areas, there's already uh, lots of, uh, of roosting structures. So we want to encourage a natural uh, bat community. But they may be beneficial in areas where the natural roosting habitat has already been removed, such as around a farmyard or uh, in a rural or in an urban area. But do not install just one bat box. Instead, install several bat boxes in a common area uh, within approximately 100 meters of each other. Um, mother bats can carry their pup from site to site, so they're not like birdhouses. The pup, the uh, the mother bats can actually move around and use a variety of structures uh, over the course of the summer. And that's a very natural behavior. And when you're installing multiple bat boxes, make sure you vary the sun exposure. Some should uh, be in more sunny locations, which are what they're going to prefer most of the time. But there should also be some in cool locations, perhaps a northern aspect uh, where there's less sunlight. Uh, so that during those really hot days in the summer, uh, they have an option to escape that intense heat. And only use large multi-chambered designs. The four-chambered nursery house, um, uh, which is a very common design, is uh, uh, one of the designs that we would recommend. Very quick overview. On the far left are the single-chambered bat boxes. These are the ones that uh, reach extreme temperatures. A better uh, design is the four-chambered uh, nursery house, uh, second from the left. And there's also this design called the rocket box, which in theory should be ideal because they can move around to different sides of the bat uh, house to um, uh, follow the sun or to get away from the sun. And uh, there's also these really large bat houses called bat condos that uh, might be suitable for uh, people with deep pockets because they tend to cost thousands of dollars to make. Bat boxes are a potentially uh, beneficial option in areas where the natural tree uh, forest habitat has been removed. And in this case, bat boxes could be installed in conjunction with a tree planting program. And the bat boxes can provide roosting space until the trees become old enough to provide uh, suitable cracks and crevices for bats. Uh, one of the uh, most important trees 
tree species for bats is balsam poplar, uh, trembling aspen are also really important. And fortunately, those are fast growing species. So within a few decades, uh, maybe 50 years or so, uh, those trees may become suitable for supporting bats. There's lots of information online uh, for uh, helping to restore uh, riparian areas and other habitat to uh, a more natural vegetation community. Our program, one of our major projects over the last few years has been to survey bridges around Western Canada. And we see we cross bridges all the time. And what we might not be aware of is that underneath a lot of these structures, uh, there is her bats uh, roosting on the surfaces of these bridges. Uh, we have uh, we have bridges. Uh, we have thousands of bridges occurring across Western Canada. And if even a fraction of these bridges are used, then they could potentially represent a really important roosting structure that bats are using in their environment. And what we found uh, looking under these bridges is that these bats are using uh, these structures for night roosting. Uh, these are uh, bridges that are used for resting during the night between their foraging boats. And before they begin flying again, they will uh, they will deposit this guano. Uh, that's bat guano right there. And we can scrape it off and use it for DNA barcoding to figure out what species are occurring in different regions. And we can also use that guano to figure out what they're eating, which I'm going to discuss here shortly. Uh, some of these bridges are also used for uh, day roosts and even as maternity roosts. Here's a quick map showing all the bridges we surveyed across Western Canada. We've surveyed about a thousand bridges at this point, and over half of these bridges have some evidence of use by bats, which is a very high proportion of bridges. Uh, the larger circles represent the bridges that have more use. So that was a quick overview of bat roosting habitat. The next thing I wanna talk about is bat food. All the bats in Canada are eating nothing but bugs. There's no bats in Canada that pollinate flowers or eat fruit. There's bats that eat all sorts of things around the world. But in Canada, all the bats are eating nothing but bugs. And based on our sampling of guano, mostly guano from bridges, but also some roosts, we've, uh, we have, we've, uh, we're starting to get a very good indication of what these bats are eating, at least the species that are using these roosts. So based on 46 uh, uh, samples as used for DNA barcoding, so this, this procedure is detecting DNA from all these different arthropods in their diet. We've detected over 181 species of flies or things that are like flies, like mosquitoes and midges. Uh, we've detected over 124 species of moths. We detect over 24 species of mayfly, over 56 spider species, over or at least eight uh, stonefly species, at least 49 uh, bugs. Uh, and these are true bugs. And one of the true one of the types of bugs that they're eating the most are these uh, water boatmen that fly at night and uh, provide really important food for bats. We've detected 58 beetle species, 46 caddisfly species, and five cricket species. And uh, we think crickets are being used by long-eared myotis, which might help explain why they're present in uh, Grand Prairie, but not throughout the rest of the boreal forest. Uh, we've, de uh, we've detected uh, 22 mosquito species, two black fly species, and the diamondback moth, which is an important agricultural pest. It's very uh, difficult to understand how important bats are for supporting our ecosystems, but just based on the enormous diversity of uh, insects that bats are eating, uh, we can speculate that they might be really important for helping to re uh, regulate, uh, uh, helping to regulate uh, insect uh, populations in their ecosystem. Here's a picture of a big brown bat. Uh, for some reason, this bat was flying during the day, which is not normal, but it did make for great pictures. It has a longhorn beetle or a Sawyer beetle in its mouth. Uh, perhaps it was flying during the day to take advantage of this abundant food source. 
There's been estimates of the importance of bats for supporting agriculture and uh, the estimate based on the US agriculture sector was upwards of uh, 50, I believe it was $53 billion. Uh, but at minimum, uh, we believe that bats are worth billions of dollars to the North American agricultural sector. Just like bats uh, uh, fly around uh, people that are gathered around a campfire when they're camping, uh, we also think that bats are probably flying around cattle at night uh, because cattle attract insects, uh, which uh, bats can target as a food source. Uh, sometimes uh, bats, uh, while they're flying, uh, come too close to uh, this particular invasive plant. This is burdock. These, this bat uh, was probably attempting to glean insects from uh, the uh, surface of this vegetation and uh, got too close and got the burr uh, tangled up on its fur. And this invasive uh, plant uh, is a potential threat to uh, uh, some bat species. The last resource I want to talk about is water. Bats don't land to drink. They rely on still they rely on still water that they can fly um, that they can uh, drink from while flying. So they skim right above the water surface. They drop their jaw into the water and take a drink. So what they need is access to clean still water, not water covered in duckweed, but uh, clean still water. Sometimes they will attempt to drink from water troughs, which is a major hazard for bats. The worst thing that you can do for bats is to put a wire directly above a water trough uh, that bats might drink from. Uh, they hit the wire and then they fall in the water and, and drown. Uh, we have lots of reports of bats falling in rain barrels as well. Uh, they, uh, they are likely trying to skim the surface of the water uh, to drink. They hit the sides of the barrel and the sides are too smooth for them to crawl out. So the best thing to do is to cover these rain barrels um, or to uh, give them a, an escape option, such as a wood log or something that they can climb to get out. There's guidelines that we have linked to on our resource page on our website for designing bat-friendly watering features. Another hazard in agricultural areas are uh, uh, barbed wire fences. There's lots of records of bats, primarily hoary bats and eastern red bats, which have these very thick tail membranes that are more likely to get entangled. There's lots of records of these bats getting snared on barbs and dying. And we don't know how important of a conservation concern this is, but we do know it's a regular occurrence. So the last thing I want to talk about is how to enhance bat habitats. I've talked how bats need access to food, water, and shelter, and to be able to uh, reach these different resources in their environment. When we think of healthy bat habitat, these uh, healthy uh, riparian habitats are really important. Uh, riparian habitats give access to water, uh, uh, productive vegetation, which supports insect food webs. And the trees and the rock uh, crevices that occur along rivers provide roosting spaces for bats. Beaver ponds are some of the most important habitats for bats. Again, they have water. The water supports productive insect communities and there's productive vegetation surrounding the, uh, the beaver ponds that also support bats. So keeping our beaver ponds is really important uh, for uh, protecting bat habitats. This view, which is a very common scene in Alberta, is not necessarily healthy bat habitat, uh, but it may still receive some degree of use. Bats are unlikely to fly over open fields, but they may still fly up and down uh, tree, tree rows or shelter belts that occur along the perimeters of fields. So in this particular example, uh, the bat, or the, the, Capacity of this landscape to support bats could be improved by uh, filling in some of the gaps that have started to form along the shelter belt or even uh, uh, planting shelter belts in regions where uh, bats might not otherwise occur. Uh, shelter belts that connect roosting habitat to uh, say, let's say a wetland that is productive foraging habitat uh, would be really beneficial to bats. Here's an aerial view of another region in Alberta. 
Uh, you can see that uh, in the uh, upper center, uh, there is some rangeland where most of the uh, tree cover has been lost due to uh, uh, overgrazing. Uh, so the tree cover has been lost. Uh, this, the ability of this, uh, of this pasture to support bats could be uh, greatly enhanced by um, some sort of strategic fencing or offsite watering. Uh, likewise, the uh, um, the shelter belts in the region could be really important for allowing bats to move around this landscape. And uh, yeah, and how those are configured could have a really important uh, influence on how bats are are accessing those different features. So a shelter belt, for example, that allows uh, bats to uh, reach this wetland. Uh, could uh, uh, could result in a greater number of bats occurring in this region. Oh, and I do want to mention uh, native trees and shrubs are the best uh, because they support native insect communities, uh, which uh, bats uh, rely on uh, for their survival. I have noticed the that the County of Grand Prairie has uh, links on their website uh, that provide uh, more information on various conservation programs occurring in Alberta and uh, could be a great way to uh, uh, to get started with a conservation project on your property. There's also lots of information resources uh, specific to either managing bats or uh, dealing with one of the conservation challenges uh, that uh, would benefit bats. So there's guides on bat-friendly fencing and uh, riparian restoration. Uh, there's that guide I mentioned on bat-friendly watering. And we have links to most of those on our website, albertabats.ca slash resources. And I want to thank everyone for joining me and uh, for our sponsors for uh, providing funding for our program and especially our community partners that allows us to uh, deliver our uh, programs throughout the province. Thank you. If awesome. I... If anyone has any questions, I'd be uh, glad to stay as long as is necessary to answer them. Yeah, if anybody um, has any questions uh, related to this talk or any other topic relating to bats, uh, they're welcome to send me an email. It's just info at albertabats.ca. So the question was, um, so there's one question asking, if there's any reason why there's more little brown bats in Alberta than uh, Saskatchewan. And the answer is, I don't entirely know. I have done survey work in Saskatchewan and it is much more difficult to catch little brown bats in Saskatchewan than in Alberta, uh, but it is very region dependent. So in, uh, for example, Grasslands National Park, little brown bats are actually relatively easy to catch. Uh, in uh, Prince Albert National Park, uh, there were there's lots of little brown bats in the actual uh, uh, community of Waskasu, but as you leave the community, there's far fewer bats. And I don't exactly know the reason. There are a lot more uh, wetlands around uh, northern Saskatchewan than in most areas of Alberta where I've worked, so that it might just be diluted more uh, across uh, um, those habitats. The little brown bats are are uh, somewhat specialists on aquatic habitats. So uh, because there's so many aquatic habitats, they might just be spread around a lot. That's one possibility. Or it could be that something like white nose syndrome has already caused population declines uh, that we haven't uh, become fully aware of. Or it could just be that there's some other um, ecological reason that we don't fully understand. Perhaps it's just farther from suitable hibernation habitats, so it's just less likely for those bats to colonize those areas. Uh, yeah, it's uh, very hard to, very difficult to understand the complex ecosystem relations that go on. So how long does it take to get a guano test done? So what our program has been doing is we collect bat guano samples throughout the uh, uh, year. And then around November or December, we submit it to the lab all as one batch. And by doing that, we can greatly cut down on the costs. It only costs us about $29 to get a test done. Uh, but it's much cheaper to submit them all at once. So we submit them in a batch in uh, November or December, and it takes about six months to get those results back. So it's not quick, uh, but at least it's uh, affordable.
to build so to find somebody to build a condo so so the condos were those really large bat houses they uh, they tend to sit on four posts now the cheapest way to do it would be to build it yourself uh, now if you were to pay somebody to build a condo and install it you're probably looking at somewhere between five thousand dollars and ten thousand dollars uh, but if you have uh, the finances for that uh, there are some builders uh, I know that have built them and the Alberta Conservation Association has uh, has been working with a builder and uh, reaching out to them might be your best option and potentially I can put you in in touch with them I uh, I will also mention the back condos one one of the things we've noticed is uh, sometimes they take a long time to be um, to, for bats to start using them the actually the bats that tend to move into bat boxes like those four chambered nursery boxes a little bit quicker than with the uh, back uh, than with the bat condos yeah the uh, so a log cabin roof uh, could support uh, potentially around a thousand bats now a bat box could support a couple hundred bats at least. And so if you have a really large colony of bats in a cabin, uh, it might be a more affordable option um, before those bats are excluded, If assuming they have to be excluded. It might be more affordable to just use bat boxes and to uh, install a lot of them. Uh, bats can spread around mul multiple uh, structures. Uh, one way of uh, enhancing the bat box designs is to add additional chambers, maybe make them a little taller and a little bit wider. Uh, but the chamber spacing spacing should still be either uh, three quarter inches or one inch. And um, I would use a lot of them and to uh, have some up in different sun, sun conditions. Yeah, so I think... I think that addresses all the questions. I'll uh, stay on for a little bit longer if anything, if there are any other questions. Uh, Corey, it looks like there's one question. Uh, Bianca said, I live in Millet. Do we have bats here and do they need help? Oh, Millet, you, you know, there are bats everywhere in uh, in Alberta and they're, they're fairly ubiqu ubiquitous and you're more likely to have bats if you're near forest or uh, a wetland or a, a water course. Um, but there's bats pretty much all around uh, around the province. So you almost certainly have bats. Um, as to how many, I'm not really sure. I need to remember where millet is, I think is my main question, my main issue though. All right. Oh, yeah. That's just a little bit south of Edmonton. Uh, yeah, there would be there would be lots of bats there. Now, if you're near Edmonton, some of the areas that have the most bats would be in the Beaver Hills uh, biosphere, and uh, just find a find a big lake somewhere like uh, um, Miquelon or any of the lakes around Elk Island, and that would be a great place to to look for bats. But uh, even an area like Millet. Probably some bats around. All right. Well, I think that uh, that concludes uh, this this talk. And thanks again to everyone for for joining me.